Bon, bienvenue tout le monde à cette conférence à l'IBIS. Euh, midi 30, je vais commencer tranquillement à présenter notre, notre invité d'aujourd'hui. Donc, notre conférencier est Dieter Taut, euh, qui est euh, directeur de Max Planck Institute euh, pour la biologie évolutive à Plon, en Allemagne. Et docteur euh, Taut est un chercheur, un des chercheurs les plus influents dans le domaine de la génétique et la génomique évolutive. Euh, il, il est professeur depuis le euh, début des années 90, où il euh, était professeur à, à, à Munich, ensuite à Cologne, et euh, plus récemment euh, au Max Planck Institute, euh, où il est directeur. Euh, il y a eu beaucoup d'influence dans le domaine, euh, comme aussi fondateur de nombreux journaux scientifiques. Il était un des, des euh, éditeurs seniors à la revue eLife, qui est, qui est née il n'y a pas très longtemps, euh, en 2015. Il a aussi été pendant longtemps euh, senior éditeur euh, senior à la revue Molecular Ecology, qui est des, des revues qui a, qui, a mis, euh, qui, a, qui a créé le domaine de, de l'écologie euh, génétique et, et génomique, euh, pratiquement. Et aussi mis sur pied de nombreux euh, autres journaux, dont euh, Frontiers in, in Zoology, euh, pour lequel il était euh, co-éditeur en, en chef. Euh, Dr. Todd a reçu beaucoup euh, de de prix et de reconnaissance euh, en Europe. Il a, entre autres, été élu comme membre de MBO euh, en, dans les années euh, 2000. Il était président de la, de la Société zoologique euh, de l'Allemagne et il a reçu plein d'autres euh, prix et, et distinctions euh, qui font de lui quelqu'un de, de très euh, reconnu, de bien connu dans, dans son domaine. Et puis justement, on peut parler un petit peu de son domaine de recherche. Il a touché vraiment à beaucoup de choses qui intéressent plein de gens ici à l'Ibis. Donc, parmi ces, ces travaux, il y a des travaux sur, euh, sur la, la spéciation, la, la génétique évolutive euh, des souris euh, donc, et, et des mammifères en général. Il a fait aussi des travaux chez les, chez les primates, euh, chez les humains. Euh, et euh, ce qui l'a amené éventuellement à l'étude de l'adaptation euh, de la génétique des populations chez les souris, ça l'a amené à étudier ou à découvrir des gènes qui étaient des gènes qui, étaient, qui avaient évolué très, très récemment dans le génome de la souris. Et puis ça, ça l'a amené vers un, 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 un domaine de recherche qu'on appelle l'étude des gènes des nouveaux, donc des gènes qui apparaissent dans les génomes euh, à partir de séquences non codantes. Et puis de là, euh, c'est développé un intérêt dans son groupe de recherche pour ces questions-là. Et ça l'a amené à faire des expériences euh, dont ils vont nous parler aujourd'hui dans lesquels euh, il s'intéresse à la fraction des séquences aléatoires qui peuvent donner des, des protéines ou des, des produits gènes qui ont euh, une fonction. So with this, uh, Dieter, I'll uh, let you uh, introduce your, your talk and thanks again for being here. We're very excited uh, to see your, your work. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the invitation and uh, Um, giving me the chance to talk on, on one of the topics which have uh, we have followed in many many years in various flavors, and um, yeah, you will see where has where it has led us. Um, so one one question that I always get, um, uh, of course, is uh, where is Plön? And you get already a feeling that it has something to do with water. So the the picture you see here is actually the view from our garden. Um, Plön is no no let's see. It's, Um, here we are. So, um, so here you see a map of Germany. So Plön is right in the northern uh, part of Germany. It's in a kind of lake district, post-glacially formed lake district. And Plön is really a little town on, on a kind of an island of lots of lakes around. And in fact, the history of, of uh, the institute there is actually pretty old. So it has a 125 years history. So you see here the institute from last year. By now, actually, this has been dismantled, and we will get a completely new building here. So um, it was founded 1892 as a biological station in, uh, in Plön because at that time there was a strong uh, move to have marine stations all over Europe, and there was the idea: okay, why don't we have also a biological station in the freshwater district? And that was the founding of the, the institute was then included in the Kaiser Wilhelm Gesellschaft, which um, uh, was the predecessor of the Max Planck Society, as it was renamed after the war. And in 2007, we renamed it into the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Biology. So it was limnology before, 
but uh, the, the former director there had the great insight to say, okay, before we understand limnology, we better understand first evolution and then we can go back to ecology. <laughs> um, so now coming to the topic of today. So it, it's really about, uh, yeah, where do genes come from or genetic functions? And I usually start with this article, which uh, sort of established one of the dogmas about the evolution of genes. It uh, appeared in 1977 and was a, was a sort of transcript of a speech that Francois Jacquard had held. And he made some very clear statements in the speech, which probably reflected what people thought at that time about uh, genes. And the one was um, um, from this article was uh, to say that the probability that a functional protein would appear de novo by random association of amino acids is practically zero. The simple argument was the following. Let's assume a protein domain or a short protein should have at least 50 amino acids. There are 20 different amino acids. So the probability that any given protein sequence arises is infinitesimally small. And therefore, that assuming that uh, most proteins would not be functional, then yeah. So it was considered highly unlikely. So where do then all the genes come from? Uh, and and the, the conclusion or the, the proposal was that novelties, new genes, come from previously unseen association of old material, meaning duplication and recombination, so specifically said to create is to recombine. And as you probably know, then the idea of, of gene emergence via gene duplication was a major evolutionary mechanism that was also proposed or popularized by Susumu Ono in his book. But then, of course, there's a big question. So where does the first, do the first functional proteins come from if everything in subsequent uh, time only evolves um, uh, via uh, duplication and recombination? And so the conclusion was that the really creative part in biochemistry must have occurred very early or on during the origin of life. And this is still one of the, the very much followed hypothesis that early on the conditions in early earth were different from today's and allowed um, uh, that uh, somehow the functional domains of proteins have emerged at that time by mechanisms that are still not understood. But there's a very active research field again, partly also because uh, people try to understand from from these exoplanets that are discovered everywhere now, of which stage of, of evolution they might have uh, and, and emerging uh, life might exist in there. Now, so that's why I call it the biochemist's view is that all gene families have arisen at the origin of life and then all the diversification came about by duplication, divergence, recombination. Now, that was also popularized um, long ago by a famous uh, little piece in, 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 uh, in Nature, Cyrus Cotia. And he proposed under this assumption that all families have arisen at that time. He said, OK, we can estimate there should be around 1,000 families, and all of these form today's proteins. But then the shock, so to speak, came with the first genome projects, and that's in 1996. And you have to say that's uh, by Bernard de Jean written a piece on the yeast genome project, which was actually only the genome project on chromosome three of the yeast, 315 KB. So absolutely feeble by today's standards. But um, I'm, I'm I'm sometimes tempted to say everything that we have learned about genome sequencing was already in these 315 KP. <laughs> but um, uh, the one of the most important conclusions at that time, uh, which was called the mystery of orphans, was uh, basically the most striking result from the chromosome 3 sequence was that approximately half of all protein coding ORFs uh, revealed by the sequence had no clear cut sequence homologs in any organism. So meaning, if they have arisen, then certainly we cannot trace where they came from. And, and that's why they're called orphans. 
So basically the genome analysis view of the evolution of genes would be that um, new genes can arise in each lineage, which are called orphan genes. And so basically the overall view would be, yes, there are a set of generally conserved gene families, housekeeping, regulatory genes that um, 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 uh, uh, found in basically all forms of life. And uh, there's at least the idea that they could have arisen right at the beginning of the evolution. Of course, they could have been exchanged by horizontal transfer later on, but let's assume they've arisen at the beginning. So there are a few thousand conserved gene families. And nowadays we think it's maybe in the order of 3000 or so. But because each of these lineages, and of course there are millions of lineages, and each of has, has its own orphans, and there's a, still about a third of the genes uh, in, in any genome are orphan. In total, we have millions of orphan genes. So we have by far more orphans or new genes than conserved genes, so to speak. So we better think about where they came from. And at least, so they're basically, there are two competing hypotheses. One is they, they are indeed duplication products, but then have diverged by accumulating so many mutations that one cannot find the, the original version of them anymore. Or the alternative view, which was contested for a long time, can they actually arise out of random sequences? And that's really what we were interested to, to, to go for and, and test. Now, how do we do this systematically? What, what brought us in, into, the, into these conclusions, actually, that there might be the novo gene evolution might be the more important mechanism in, in often gene creation? Well, it all started with a postdoc in my lab, uh, Thomas Love Thomas at Lozo. He thought about, um, um, or had the idea of what he called phylostratigraphy. It's basically when you have uh, completely sequenced genomes, then you can put them into a tree. Of course, the tree you, you have to define yourself, but the tree is then um, giving you nodes at which you can make distinctions between different um, lineages. And by this, you can what we call phylostrata. You basically defined by the nodes of the species that you have in the tree. And then you can basically ask for a set of genes, or basically for all of the genes, when you, for example, for humans, is this gene A also existing in any of these other species? And if it is, then you put it to the, the origin of the whole radiation. This does not exclude that the occursion is lost in some lineages, but by, by majority is there. And so it's basically an old node. But then there's a gene N, for example, that occurs only in this lineage and um, not in any other lineage. So basically you can make an H graph of all genes. How does it look like in a real example, in this case for Drosophila melin augusta, for example, so you, you ask for all genes that occur in, or annotated in Drosophila melin augusta, uh, in which phylostrata or, or in which nodes uh, they fall. And then you find basically for all organisms, there's always a third or so are actually going back to the cellular origin. And this is indeed uh, what we call the gene families, the conserved gene families. But then in every, other, in every node throughout the phylogeny, you will always find a fraction of genes that have seemed to have arisen at that stage. Of course, that's by blast analysis with that, with, which has its uh, problems, but um, overall, this is the picture. Now, this is a categorical distinction. Of course, the, these nodes have different time uh, uh, associated with it. And so you can make a time scale tree. Um, and then it looks like this. Now, now it's actually for the mouse. Um, so we use, again, we use all genes of the mouse and then ask where do the, did they arrive from and then look at the uh, the emergence rate of so founder genes per million years, because we have now a time scale here. And now, um, although the largest fraction of genes comes from the cellular origin, but the time that is, that is involved here is uh, so extremely long, so the rate is actually not particularly high. Could be different if you have more time points here, but this is how it is. But then you have interesting peaks, and we can look at them. So basically here we have prokaryotes, basal eukaryotes. Here we have a peak where the metasomes arise 
We have another peak where the mate uh, vertebrates arise. Then, then the, the key lineage that, that leads to the rodents, the boroeutherians, has also a nice peak. Now, interestingly, this gene, this new gene gain somehow predate the morphological radiations because the morphological radiation that is visible in the fossil record, the Cumbrian explosion, is around this time. Well, the gene gain seems to be have occurred earlier. So the, the differentiation in, in, in metasomes must have occurred independent of the morphological radiation. Also here we have um, uh, the uh, end of the Cretaceous. So um, the mammalian radiation occurs after already uh, gene gains have seemed to have occurred. But now, most interestingly, if you look at the most recent lineage, so here, the, the mouse uh, species, moose species, uh, they show actually the highest rates of new gene emergence uh, counted by founder genes per million years. Now, this uh, suggests that there is some mechanism of fast gain, but also fast loss, because with this rate, you would uh, fill up the genome very quickly with hundreds of thousands of genes. So you, you have, seem to have a high gain, but also fast gain, fast loss mechanism here. And one important thing, so this is uh, the note here is 25 million years. So within that time, any gene duplication mechanism would show up, you would find the founder genes. So all of the genes that are recorded here are not created by gene duplication. They must have come out of the non-coding part. And this is really where we got uh, sort of convinced more and more that de novo gene emergence must be very important and also creating these, these other pit, uh, patterns that we see. Because for the older lineage, it's almost impossible to say, is it a duplication divergence mechanism or is it a de novo gene mechanism? But for the newest lineages, uh, we are pretty sure that it's a de novo gene emergence. So how does the novo gene emergence, or how do we prove it? How do we trace it? And, and the standard is really, you need a very dense phylogeny. So here on a very closely related species, for example, 10 million years apart, you have um, a syntenic region defined by, by conserved genes that you find in all members of this lineage. But then, and, and because it's relatively closely related, you can align also the non-coding parts. And then you ask, is there a, a transcript somewhere in this non-coding region? And if you find a, a, a pure transcript, then you can may call it a protogene. If it's already a sort of a functional gene and that is um, you know, non-coding, it could be an RNA gene or a protein coding gene. And this is what we call the de novo uh, evolution. Now, so the, the general idea would be then that um, there's a gene birth process, there must be a gene death process, and um, there is something that's going on with a very high rate that creates protogenes, which eventually through an abductive phase may become true genes. And of course, then there's a gene duplication, rate transposition, fusion, and so on. Is, is, uh, these are all well understood mechanisms. But then you have, of course, also a loss mechanism. In, in... So um, coming back to the dogma, why, why did it got it this, this part wrong? Is, is simply, if one assumes that a large fraction of random peptides or random sequences is already bioactive, then this calculation here becomes completely meaningless. Even if one particular protein is highly, highly unlikely to arise, but if let's say 30% of all random sequences have already a function, then this consideration does not even apply anymore. So th this is really what drove us then to the point to, to ask, can we do an experiment to ask which fraction of random sequences is already bioactive when it is born, so to speak. And that's how we eventually then switched to E. coli as, a, as, a, uh, as an organism, although we had not really worked with it before. And of course, we made uh, typical mistakes uh, that uh, one, <laughs> one is always doing when one starts with a new system, as you will see. But 
in the end, we, we came to a conclusion, and, and that was published in this paper, uh, that random sequences are indeed an abundant source of bioactive RNAs or, pro or peptides. So what, how was that experiment done? Um, well, it was in the end relatively simple. So in between, we had much more complicated schemes how we would approach that because actually we thought initially, oh, it would be only one in 10,000 or so which would have an activity, but uh, it turned out to be so simple as that. So it's, it's an um, expression vector basically with an inducible promoter. So it has a, a fixed start sequence, it has a stick fixed end sequence. Um, and then we cloned a, a random uh, sequence in between with a length of 50 amino acids. So the alignments look like that. Start is always the same, end is always the same, but in between it's a random sequence. And then we simply ask if we, if we make a library of these sequences and let them compete, then those which have a growth advantage should get enriched and those with a disadvantage could, they should uh, get less. And nowadays one is doing very similar experiment with, with tagging, but we didn't even need tagging because the sequences themselves were the tags, so to speak. So you could directly sequence them from the different phases. So the design of the experiment was that we basically distributed, uh, so we did an overnight culture, then distributed in 10 parallels and um, let them grow, take uh, the plasmids for sequencing, but then also always uh, make a, in a, a, a one in 100 dilution um, to let them grow another cycle. And then again, uh, so we did a total of, of uh, four cycles and because of the dilution regime we chose, it's actually one in 10 dilution, I'm sorry, not one in 100, because we wanted to avoid bottleneck effects in this experiment. So the total is of 20 generations after four cycles. So, and then of course you sequence all the plasmids and then you can um, trace the individual trajectories. And here I have picked out uh, four nice examples two that went up in frequency and two that went down in frequency. So you see this is sort of from the 10 parallels. So we have good repeatability across the 10 parallels. And this is clearly going up and this is clearly going down. I should say not all trajectories look so clean, but um, you always can at least classify up or down uh, from start to end. This is the, how the overall experiment looks like. Actually, we use um, um, basically the same uh, analysis scheme as you would use for RNA-seq experiments, where you ask um, uh, what is the difference between the two conditions, and, and here it's uh, the different cycles. So this is under conditions where we uh, induce the expression, and this is without induction. So without induction, basically, there is no much not much free frequency change between the different cycles, um, proving that there's not a drift effect that we see here. And uh, with induction, we see an increasing difference over time, both into the negative, but also into the positive side. So we did this uh, experiment uh, seven times, at least seven times, but uh, seven times the full analy analyzed. Two, two different versions. So we did three hour cycles or 24 hour, hour cycles. That's uh, the overall statistics. Then you can well, look up the enriched or depleted uh, and, and so on. And the, the overall conclusion is that up to 40% of the uh, random sequences show a negative growth effect, which we call neck in the following and 20% of them show positive growth effect, which we call POS in the, in the following. So the, the overall result from this experiment is indeed that the bioactive molecules are extremely abundant. And in retrospect, it's actually not, not super surprising that they are because that's what chemists do since decades. They synthesize random chemicals, throw them in cells and ask whether they have an activity. And if they have, they follow it up for, for pharmacological reasons. And so why, what works with chemicals, why shouldn't it work with peptides as well? So in, in retrospect, it's uh, 
Yeah, as I said, initially we thought it might be one in 10,000, but uh, of course, every peptide can interact with something in the cell. Okay, but still the experiment was then challenged by various people. And uh, the challenge was really about not uh, that we found uh, peptides with negative effects, that's apparently what everybody expected anyway, but um, that there were all the positive effects. And um, that was one um, uh, little letter or correspondence by Michael Knopp and Dan Anderson, who said, uh, okay, what if your vector, uh, which is sort of depicted here, has already a gross disadvantage because it, the vector itself produces also a peptide uh, because that's how it's constructed. And so they ask, um, what is the relative growth rate if you add no IPTG versus IPTG? So, and, and then they measure growth rates and say, okay, if you, the vector itself is already growing slower, um, then it has a disadvantage. So the possibility is when you add something into the vector, so basically saying this peptide may, may have a disadvantage. Give a disadvantage to the cell, maybe a negative one. If you give a new one into that, then the, the disadvantage may be relieved, uh, independent of what, what is coded here. And that's what they try to show here. So they actually use some of our clones to put into that. They showed, um, there, there is an effect uh, on, on the growth. And then they said, okay, if you, if you just remove the ribosome binding site, for example, or put a terminator sequence or remove the, the promoter, then you also have a better effect of the vector. It would look like a positive effect, but it is uh, basically just not expressing the peptide. So their conclusion was that any random DNA sequence that reduces the cost of the vector expression will increase in frequency in the population of competing clones. And then, therefore, it seems artificially beneficial. And uh, admittedly, we had not considered this possibility and, and therefore had not tested it before. But, but now, by now, we have gone on with testing this uh, question. So, um, so the first thing was in, in the original paper, we had um, only looked at full length um, sequences. So, but of course, if you do clone random sequences, then there will be lots of stop codons in between. We had ignored these in the initial analysis. But then we said, and that had the disadvantage that we had not traced the vector itself because it has only a shorter peptide in it. So we redid all the analysis across all experiments that we did for all length classes. And that basically still gave a similar pattern. So we're here in the different cycles. And if you watch here, the, uh, the position of the vector itself, it's actually in, in close to not changing its frequency at all. That meaning, at least under the conditions that we have here, the vector, the vector itself is not, has not a negative effect. So it's not, so the positives, a much more positive, so it's not about releasing a negative vector effect um, that creates a positive peptide under these conditions. So we think that at least this interpretation is not quite correct, but it may still have, be part of, of our results. So, but what we can do now is because we look at all length classes and uh, all compositions of peptides, we can also look at other interesting insights. Namely, for example, ask, um, are, are peptides, shorter peptides more likely negative or longer peptides more likely negative? And so we can um, make these distribution plots. So what you see here is, is in gray, is the length distribution of all sequences in the library. So they, of course, the shorter ones are more abundant because the probability of having a stop code on um, sort of becomes increases. And since we had an artificial stop code on the longest ones expected simply you know, uh, create this class. There's also this class that's unexpected, but this is because we have a common deletion in these vectors. Um, so it's not so important for the experiment. So now if we classify what we have, the negative and the positive peptides, 
then we see a sort of bimodal distribution. So very short ones seem to be negative. And the long ones seem to be negative, more likely negative, while the positive peptides um, are more likely to be in the length range around yeah, yeah, 10 to 20, 25 amino acids. So argues also against a generic effect, there are specific effects in there, but interestingly, the vector turned out to have a problem, again, for the design of the experiment. So Keep in mind, so the first four amino acids are the same because we synthesized them as part of, of the whole thing. And, it, and then, of course, because we have among the random sequence, we have also those which start basically with a stop codon. We have uh, clones that express only those four peptides. And it turns out most of them are negative. So there are 70% of those that uh, express only four amino acids are, are negative. Very few are positive. And if you have five amino acids, that is already down already with six amino acids, only two more than it's close to average uh, fraction of negatives and the average fraction of positives. So we see, uh, oh yeah, we see that this explains this peak here at least. Uh, but but it's also a very interesting observation because if these four amino acids are negative, how can we still have some clones at least that have a positive effect? And that shows us that we had also observed before that the RNA sequence alone can uh, confer an effect independent of whether it's actually translated or not. And that has also been found by others that uh, sometimes by even small changes in an RNA sequence without changing the protein, you can have more positive or more negative effects. So somehow we, we keep ignoring that because it's, it's more difficult to systematize what the RNA effects are because there must be some folding structures, but we don't understand them properly. But you, you can keep this in mind, of course, in the background of all of that is also the, the RNA effect. Okay, we could also look at GC content distribution. Again, we see two peaks, but this is again due to this uh, four amino acid effect. Sorry, my slides don't want to advance as fast as I want them. Okay, uh, we looked also at the aggregation potential and here, um, so um, this is a, a, a calculation of an algorithm that tries to look for, for tendency of amyloid formation so that uh, proteins precipitate. Uh, and indeed, for the negative ones, we see a higher tendency of precipitation than for those which are positive or, or neutral. And we call them non-significant here. OK, now um, studying individual clones. So, and this is, uh, they are highlighted here, which clones we, we picked. Uh, so we have a group of negative ones. We have a group of non-significant ones, neutral ones and a group of um, uh, positive ones. So let's start with the negative ones, which um, um, naively I thought it would be easier to study them, but they, they had a completely, well, yeah, let's go through the evidence. So what happens? So if you have, so here you see growth curves of uh, six negative clones and compared to the vector alone. And you see always induced versus uninduced. And you see an amazing effect for basically all of them that uh, they, they have a lag time. So for the first few hours, they, they don't really grow. And then after a while, they start growing exponentially almost with the same rate as, as if they would not be induced. So that's quite odd. So we ask, are these, by inducing them, are these so negative that they basically kill most of the cells and then only a few um, mutant survivors are there and eventually will grow? So we ask, <coughs> are the cells in this phase actually dead? And we find, oops, they are actually not dead. So if you look at the viability in this early phase of induction, then cell numbers, viable cell numbers actually don't go down very strongly. They go down after 10 hours, but not initially. So basically their growth arrested during this phase. 
And if you look at, at expression measures, and we use microarrays for that, um, you see actually very strong transcriptomic response. And, and, and so what we compare here is a, is a set of top genes that have changed in the negative uh, uh, peptides. And we use here as a control, we use the same negatives, but introducing an early stop codon so that they don't produce a protein. So here we have cut out the RNA effect, so to speak. It's really the protein effect that we see here. And if one uh, looks at the classification of these genes, Um, you look at the, uh, the GO terms and you see which ones are induced. And it's basically here you have fate shock, chaperone cofactor dependent protein refolding, protein refolding, and all of that. So basically, it's a typical stress response of the, of the cells. By inducing these negative peptides, there's a strong stress response, and the, the cells apparently recover after a while from the stress response and then grow normally. So we assume there's an epigenetic response going on in these cells. And you probably know that there is a, also a lot of methylation activity in, in, in coli, which can change um, expression stages. But we have not followed this up uh, further. But what we know, if you look um, at the PC, uh, PCA from the transcriptomes, so after one hour, all have a sort of distress response. So they're very, very homogeneous. After 16 hours, they go into different trajectories, apparently. And we don't know how they manage to assume gro resume growth. But anyway, it's a very generic effect. It might be interesting for microbiologists to follow up. But we, we of course, wanted to know what the peptides are doing. So for the negative ones, it's a little bit annoying because they seem to be stressed. They simply create stress for the cells. But now let's go for the positive ones. So the positive ones, if we compare um, uh, growth trajectories, so these are six, um, uh, yeah, six peptides uh, that um, uh, compared induced versus uninduced. You you might see that there are small differences, but in fact, if you calculate growth rates, they're not significantly different. So they don't have an effect on the primary growth rate. But of course, our experiment is not on growth rates, it's on competition across several growth cycles. And so we, we used an um, experimental setup developed by Lensky. Um, to use these two strains that, which uh, come out of his ancestral E. coli long, uh, are the ancestral strains of his long term evolution experiment. They're called REL 606 and REL 607. And the only difference is that they have a point mutation in the Arabinose utilization gene. And that makes them wonderful indicator strains because um, you can distinguish. Um, um, them simply on the agar plates by the uh, by the, uh, the color of the clones. So what you do basically, you have exactly the same background with the exception of this one nucleotide difference. You clone uh, uh, two different strains, uh, the two different uh, vectors in them, and ask, uh, and then compete them against each other, and ask whether after some time, one of them wins over the other. And this is indeed the case for, for our uh, uh, positive peptides. So we have here we have them, and we compare them to what we call a non-significant clone. So that has not changed in the overall competition experiment. Basically, always they have a fitness advantage. Some have a stronger advantage than this, some have a weaker one. And uh, then you can, of course, to exclude the possibility of a strain effect, you can uh, clone them in the reverse uh, combination, and we see actually the same distribution. So, in, in, so we can confirm these peptides provide a positive growth effect to the cells under competition uh, uh, conditions, but you cannot measure these in the in simple growth curves. Okay. So again, we did uh, transcriptomic analysis. And what we saw is, first of all, 
only very, very weak effects are there, which you could even say, as you know, because you have always a cutoff of 5%, you could say, okay, that's, that's also a random fluctuation. So we don't even know whether it's a real effect that we see on the transcriptome, but what we see is the different peptides have different top genes. Uh, of course, uh, at least that is reproducible in independent experiments. So, uh, they always come up with certain operons. But on, on overall, there's very little change in the transcriptome uh, uh, by these. So they, they seem to have only very subtle effects. Unfortunately, not in a way where we could directly pinpoint what is the pathway that they are addressing. Or maybe, yeah, maybe it could eventually, but th that would require many more experiments. Um, and yeah, we are not microbiologists, really. OK. Now we went on. So one other uh, criticism of the experiment is that it was based on a vector that and it was a high copy number vector. So it was really strongly expression of, of, the, of the protein. And, and then the, the, the argument was that this is not very natural. So what we then designed the next experiment is to do the same in, in eukaryotic cells and actually use a design where we uh, recombine uh, the, uh, the plasmid or, or the random sequence in a specific location. So they are all under the same promoter, but integrated into the genome, so it's a single copy only. So the design is similar as for the bacteria, but of course adapted to the, the eukaryotic library. So we put a COSAC sequence for the, for the ATG. We used another tag sequence, which is used a lot in eukaryotes to, to tag proteins. Um, okay, then we created the library again. So it's a new library. Uh, and um, used uh, site-specific recombination uh, via the FLIP system to put them into a human cell line. And then the idea is again to, to just grow the cell lines and see whether clones become enriched or not enriched. I should say is again an, an experiment where we use also an inducible promoter, uh, toxic cycling or tetracycline in, induction promoter. And we had hoped that we see a difference between uh, induction and non-induction. So here we sample every 48 hours and then do again sequencing. So the overall result is actually very similar as an E. coli. So um, here you see, for example, time point uh, uh, two versus one, and we have a total of 10 time points. So that's the, the last. Uh, time point here, 10 versus one. And you see an enrichment. So it's again by this uh, DSEC2 analysis where we could look for um, um, significant enrichment and, and you see negative effects. And, and if you calculate these proportions, they're actually very similar as the neck on the positive clouds in E. coli, so about 40% negative, 20% positive ones, which is, <laughs> I don't know, but it's it. We should be happy to see that, or we should be worried that we have um, we have again missed something very generic, and it, <laughs> we don't know. Uh, that's that's all under. It's somewhat preliminary results because there was one disappointment after we looked in the in the in the individual trajectories of of uh, positive and negative clones. So the trajectories look fine, but if you look at the detail here. So the black ones are the control and the, the green ones are the ones induced with doxycycline. And basically they, we see almost no difference. And it turned out that somehow in our controls, the genes were, the, our plasmid was also activated. We still don't exactly understand why. Which brings us back, yes, that's also cell cultures are also a new system for us and we still have to understand that. But given the congruence, we are not worried that the, the, the whole thing could be an artifact. We, we believe that these are indeed, I mean, each of these time points is 10 flasks and in two different conditions. So it would be very funny if that would be all artifact. So let's, so the experiment has not fully worked the way we wanted, but we still can infer from it that there are positive and negative clones. <clears throat> 
So let's assume they are real. Then we can do the same comparison as we did in E. coli. And now actually we see no real length dependence for the negative and positive ones. So they basically there's, they're distributed all across um, the overall length distribution of the library. Here for comparison, again, the E. coli distribution, which are a little bit more biased. Um, and again, also aggregation energy. So that's again the E. coli picture uh, where we had a, an effect of negative ones. Here in eukaryotic cells, we do not see any difference between the negative and the positive. What I may add that at least for one negative clone uh, that we have current preliminary data, we see also a, a stress response in the cells, in this case, a chaperon response, but we still have to do more of that. Okay. Coming already to conclusion. So a large, so we, we remain convinced that our experiments show that a large fraction of random sequence clones can affect the growth of cells. And that's true for E. coli and eukaryotes. So this argument that the probability that the functional protein would appear de novo by random association of amino acids is practically zero is actually, we should say, is rather likely. And um, of course, just an effect on cell growth doesn't tell us immediately what kind of genetic function is it. But of course, it's, it's a first step towards becoming a functional gene through further evolutionary optimization. That's at least how a gene, new gene could start. It has an effect and then uh, become better over time. But the important thing is, and this is actually came also out from our other experiments of studying real de novo genes in mouse. So we have studied a few of them by knockout ex uh, experiments. And one recent one that we published uh, turned out to be a gene that is uh, regulates female pregnancy cycles. So it has a very specific effect in one particular tissue. And, and in this case, we have even a little network where we know where it has been integrated. But the important thing in this context is in this study, we found that no optimization was required. The gene basically became active through a certain uh, mutation so that the open reading frame existed where it was not before in, in the other lineages and had immediately this effect um, um, on, on an actually uh, uh, fitness relevant uh, trait in the mouse. So that brings me to the overall conclusion, again, to remind you of the, the key uh, figures. So the, I think we, we are pretty sure that, so combining this phylostratigraphy pattern, which is very similar for basically all organisms, that you always have a very high rate of new genes in the newest lineages, tells us that this part of the cycle of gene birth must be very active throughout evolution. And then, of course, those who get eventually integrated are those which then seem to predate actually the morphological consequences because they, they are already active somehow and then eventually become in integrated into a new lineage, which is differentiated by new morphology. And, and this uh, figure basically, again, is, is to show you if, if you, yes, you can sort of divide the clones and negative positives and, and more or less neutral ones, and a large fraction of them has an effect. So um, conclusion is expressed random sequences provide uh, constantly a rich source for the evolution of new genes. And this is why I want to stop. Yeah. Thank you very much for this talk. That's uh, awesome work. Uh, 